What's up everybody? This is Eddie from Flex Arm and we are coming at you live from YouTube live stream here in our beautiful facility right here in Walpock, Ohio. And today for our demo, we're going to space. Well, not really, but for those of you who thought that tapping wasn't rocket science, today we are here to show you that it surely is. Now before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. You'll notice on this side of the screen there is a chat box. With this being a live and interactive live stream, we definitely promote and anticipate each and every one of you to hit any type of comments or questions you may have right in that chat box. And you never know, you might be lucky enough, we'll pull those bad boys up and answer them in real time. You'll also notice on this part of the screen there is a subscribe button. You hit that subscribe button, hit that bell to turn on the notifications so we can keep you in the loop with all the amazing content we'll be releasing in the near future. And last but certainly not least, give us a huge thumbs up. So to talk a little bit about what we got going on today, we have our great partners and good friends from Launcher as well as OSG. So to tell us about the awesomeness behind Launcher, we have the brains behind it. My man, Max, come on in here, man. Hey, good to have you, Max. What's the good, good word, morning, yo? yo. Hey. Uh, well, great to be here, so uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we know a lot about Launcher. There's a lot of amazing things you're doing, but for the viewers who may not be as familiar, can you give us the who, the what, and the why behind Launcher? Sure. We're a startup based in uh, New York City, and we're building an orbital launch vehicle to deliver small satellites to orbit. Uh, you could shorten that to building a rocket to deliver satellites to orbit. Um, there's a new um, series and of companies and rockets that are basically building smaller rockets than what you might see from SpaceX to deliver smaller satellites. All the satellites are now shrinking in size thanks to the advance of electronics and so on. And so Launcher's big differentiator is that we are focused on performance, performance of the engine, which means we can carry more satellites for the same rocket size and the rocket cost. Right now we're still in the middle of the development program of our liquid rocket engine. And that's our other differentiator, which we focus on the engine first. And uh, this will culminate in a test flight in around 2024. So we still have a, a way to go. So our liquid rocket engine is called, and we can maybe pull up some of the graphic uh, of the rocket first. Um, let me go the camera. Uh, I'm looking. There so this is a launch vehicle that will be powered by four of the engine, uh, the combustion chamber, which is with us, 3D printed, and one on the second stage, which you can see behind the, the black ring there. Then we can go to the next uh, photo, please, Isaac. Um, and these are the two engines we are building. On the left, uh, it's called E2 for the first stage, and on the right, E2 for the second stage with the larger nozzle. But you can see the combustion chamber, which is the copper part in the middle, is the same. And right here, we have this part, uh, which is the largest part of the engine uh, that we're going to tap today with your, with, the, with your help at Flexarm. If we go to the next slide. Um, so um, ultimately, at the end, it will be polished on the inside and outside, look more like this one. And the design we have here, which we expect it to be the highest performance, lowest cost engine of its size, it's a 22,000 pound of thrust, has really been informed by uh, about three years of development at a subscale of 1,000 thousand pound thrust. So we can look quickly, and that's the engine called E1, much smaller, uh, but we'll, we'll show a quick video of the, of the test of E1, uh, which I can comment on in a minute. So here you go, oh, wow. this is at our test site in Long Island, if you haven't seen anything. Now it starts with a pretty fuel rich, and then we optimize the mixture ratio between the liquid oxygen and kerosene, and we get to a point where we have a blue flame, uh, which is very unusual for a uh, kerosene-based engine, and it basically demonstrates that we have very high efficiency, more than 98% combustion efficiency. So it means the liquid oxygen and kerosene that enters the combustion chamber uh, is converted into energy at, at least 98%. So, that's obviously much smaller, and so right now, if we can put the next slide, uh, we have won a, an Air Force SBIR contract phase two uh, to test our full-scale engine at NASA Stennis in September. And so right there, that's actually a render behind uh, an existing stand. So this is the stand that our team right now in New York City is building, and you can see right at the front, there is the combustion chamber and the injector, uh, and here today, we have the combustion chamber. It's not yet as shiny, we'll need some polishing, uh, but the most important is obviously today the tapping and then we continued on the process of getting ready uh, to test fire in September. Uh, the other piece to note is that this piece is 3D printed in a single piece and it is the largest single piece combustion chamber ever 3D printed in the world. Uh, it also, if we succeed, could be the highest performance, lowest cost uh, engine of its class ever developed. 
Uh, but obviously we need to test the full scale, which we haven't done yet. This is the first ever created that will be tested in September. And then with the results, we'll uh, either have iterations or uh, we'll have, you know, good, great result on the first go and we'll see how it goes. So. There we go. Nice like we like said, man, man, Flex Arms going to space eventually. We're getting there. So orbit, right on, man. Hey, there, there you go. No, it's which is awesome. You yeah, sure? No, we definitely, uh, we really appreciate it. It's seriously awesome to have this type of technology and capabilities here. So when we get to that point where you're really just making things happen, it'll be good to know and be able to watch from its beginning point. Yeah, so. and, uh, and just to add, you know, we, we actually started these steps manually. Uh, we should have pulled a photo. I don't think we have right. it. Um, and because we had to clean the chamber and then we found a flex arm and, and we called Nick and the team and, mm -hmm. and basically asked whether we could get some help. In, uh, in helping us finishing the tap with the arm. Mm -hmm. And uh, in less than uh, two months, I think, Nick, uh, you guys did this. Uh, and it's pretty incredible that from the idea to jump on the project, use your technology and your product, mm -hmm. uh, and be ready today to do the eight taps uh, that we need. So we'd really like to thank Flexarm for your amazing product, but team and facility for and for building this fixture for launcher. Yeah, always Thank a pleasure and never a chore, truly, man. So, and to talk a little bit about the process, because it definitely wasn't one, two, or even three people that made this happen. We've actually brought in our Vice President of Engineering and Research and Development, my man, Alex. Alex, you with us right now, man? Yeah, absolutely, Eddie. How are you? Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So with that being said, Alex, can you tell us a little bit about the process and everything that it took to make this happen today? Yes, absolutely. As uh, Matt would mention, it, we, it was a, a, a group project that we needed to incorporate everybody from our tooling manu uh, manufacturers and partners to uh, team and which is uh, the people that help us a lot with the design and the picturing. We essentially uh, follow six, six stages. The first one was the design plan. How are we going to do it? Who's going to do what? The second one is the fixture design that we actually work on 3D renderings. Uh, 3D drawings, models, and also the schedule. Uh, the third one is the release of those drawings that we were, we were going to use for fabrication and uh, team and we're going to use in their shop. The second one, uh, sorry, the fourth one is the fabrication where all the parts were made. The fifth, uh, the fifth one is the assembly, and the sixth one is the uh, essentially launch or visit and also doing all the uh, testing while we're using this uh, fixture for the nozzle or the rocket. No, very good, man. Obviously, a lot of moving parts. So teamwork makes that dream work. And speaking of teamwork, we got our good friend Dylan from OSG. Dylan, what's going on, man? What's up, Eddie? How are you today? Hey, it's a great day to potentially go to space or into orbit, as we say. So no worries, man. But with that being said, obviously, uh, we love having OSG with us. And I know we're going to be featuring a couple of your taps. So again, for those who may not be as familiar with the OSG brand, can you tell us who is OSG and why are you so stinking awesome? So OSG is a, a round tool cutting manufacturer. We manufacture grills, taps, and end mills. And I am the district manager for Central Ohio. So I'm responsible for the, the sales and technical support and the distribution of OSG throughout the Dayton and Columbus area. And today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be showing off some bright finished taps and tapping copper. There we go. We see one of these beasts right here. You recognize this bad boy, Dylan? I do. There we go, there we go, we're excited to show it. So hey, thanks for joining us today. We'll make sure to hit you with a couple of questions in between. Remember everybody, that chat section is open and live, so feel free to show any questions you may have. And then last but certainly not least, we're gonna bring in president and owner of Flex Machine Tools, my man Nick. Nick, what are we doing today? Thank you, Eddie. Hey, uh, so I, he's holding up the tap here, but I've got the pleasure of uh, helping with the prototyping. So that way, I guess if we, if we mess it up, it's my fault. But, uh, but no, this is a good example, so I'll, I'm going to go through some of the setup, you guys. Hey, Alex, do you have uh, some renderings of the, of the picture so we can show that a little bit better? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think I let's, start... Let's pull those uh, up quickly. I want to show that before we go into the, the tab. And perhaps uh, Steve can help us uh, with some of the description of some of the uh, models and why we decided to go into some of those right. uh, design phases. There we go. Yeah, great. There we go. Hey Steve, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the process from here in designing the fixture and uh, the collaboration we had to come up with that, that end result right there that we can see? Uh, yes, um, of course we had uh, some initial meetings with uh, the launcher and FlexArm team as well as Teeman uh, over in New Bremen. Um, and we just kind of understood what, what the uh, end goal was. Uh, of course, you know, one, one big thing is uh, how to, how to 
load the, load the fixture and uh, present it properly to the arm or have the arm be presented properly to the, the, the nozzle. Um, and then just trying to figure all that out and, and get it done quickly and uh, efficiently for, for the demo today. I think one of the the biggest uh, key design uh, features that we had to take into account was uh, the unique angles that we have to perform all the tapping. And in order to do that properly, we have to have a fixture that will allow us to rotate the part uh, freely and find those specific angles. Even we have to make adjustments of one or two degrees, which that in the end is, a, is the biggest challenge, especially if you have multiple parts in one single workpiece. That's what it becomes very difficult to do in a different machine compared to the flex arm, which it gives you that flexibility, especially when you can rotate the part and you have a multi-position head that allows you to position that head directly into the, the feature. Yes, um, agreed. The, uh, uh, we actually made a, 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 a prototype uh, test, uh, test piece so we could test it prior to... Uh, um, actually putting the copper nozzle in, in, in the see, unit that's, itself. That's, so. that's what you can see right now. We'll go back to an image of the, uh, the... So this is a replica, obviously, that Demon fabricated so we can test the fixture before we actually have... Because like Max was saying, um, the actual part, there's there's only one. So uh, not, a, not a lot of opportunity for error. And obviously, we needed a way to test it out. So this was a great design. And, and it just goes to show what Demon could fab up because it's like a miniature rocket. <laughs> That's a great and, job, Steve. And, and the great part, uh, Nick, is that, and kudos to Timon, is that the part it also mimics the weight of the uh, workpiece from Max, and the center of gravity is almost uh, identical to the uh, the actual workpiece. So that's that's incredible. I agree. It's, so it's, it's pretty cool. This is uh, a great concept. Um, and then uh, so that's a little bit on the on the fixture, and then moving on to show, again to talk about the tap a little bit more. So you'll notice from OSG. Short of ordering custom taps, and we'll be able to get a better image here. So these are the standard taps that OSG qualified for this material, obviously, but uh, we had to make special adapters to because these are monster taps, and to fit them properly into our, our tooling, uh, these are uh, adapters, complements of uh, Adam Booth, A Bomb 79. So if you don't already know who he is, he's a pretty big deal, but uh, he's got great videos showing how he whipped these things up and machined them, and they just turned out they're excellent. So, but, uh, but you'll notice the, the colors. So it's super advanced how we decided to control our depth, but uh, just a simple paint pin, guys. We did some testing here and we'll kind of go through that process here and I'll show you how we did it. But the red line is to do not exceed uh, for a couple of reasons. A, we'll either just drive the MPT too deep or we'll come into the rocket and we'll crack something, which would be uh, end, of, end of the game. So that's not gonna happen. But, uh, but that, you'll notice that's what we, that's, we've simply just painted lines for depth control. And part of that reason is too, with the, uh, we'll pan out here. What Max was saying, so how, with the, with the fixture that Alex designed, or uh, that described so well, you'll notice we get everything in position. And now I'm gonna take my tap and in order to align everything well, because Max mentioned he, they'd hand tap this so they could do some pressure tests prior to us getting started. So we want to make sure everything's aligned really well. And there were a lot of unknowns. So I'm just, we're simply getting it started here. And then I'm going to hook up our multi-head on the unit. I'll show that a little bit better. So we, we've shown this before, but obviously this is the multi-position head. And that's how we're going to get everything. So I'm going to... I'm simply gonna snap it on here, align my head, which we've already done in this case. So that way I know I'm in line. I'm gonna be able to follow that hole right in as we tap it horizontally. So just to go through that process here. So now that the arm's connected, so we're, we're ready to start that process of, uh, of, of pushing the tap through. But before we do, I want to show, I want to talk a little bit about the, the chambers and how we're adding air to the unit. You guys can, because it's super critical that we don't get chips inside of these chambers. And I think, Max, I'll pull you back in. I'm going to have you talk a little bit more about the specifics now that we have a nice image here. So if you grab the camera, come up over here a little bit. I want to show the, I want to show this a little bit better while he describes it. Just so everybody can see what the, ro and actually, actually I'm going to click this off so you guys get a better view, view of the, of the rocket. rocket. 
Yeah, so this part is the uh, combustion chamber. It's the largest part on the liquid rocket engine. Typically, you would have two major parts of a liquid rocket engine. You have the turbo pump assembly, uh, which we are developing but not showing here. And then you have the combustion chamber with the injector. Uh, the injector would be right there, and it's not here today. Uh, that's smaller, so we can machine it traditionally. Uh, so this part, as I mentioned, is probably the largest single piece 3D printed combustion chamber. So everything from the nozzle shape uh, to the manifolds, the port, and all the cooling channel inside was all printed by our partner AMCM, which is a subsidiary of EOS Group, AMCM.com. And they designed basically what is the world's largest uh, powder bed metal 3D printer, the M4K. So the way this works, why do we have ports here? Actually, on the inside surface of the combustion chamber, you have a wall uh, and there's obviously no access from these ports. What these ports are used for is to feed with either the liquid oxygen for this piece or the kerosene for this piece to feed the propellant from the rocket tank into the wall of the chamber so that we can cool down this copper alloy so that it can withstand the, the combustion temperature. So it's not so intuitive uh, and people outside the industry don't fully know this, but the combustion temperature we need to reach orbit is about three times higher than the melting point of this copper. So the only reason this is possible is because we run the propellant through the wall. There are hundreds of cooling channels before we enter the combustion chamber and combust them. And so that's why 3D printing is amazing because we can, in one piece, not only have the manifold, the ports, the combustion chamber shape, uh, the inner wall, but we also have all these cooling channels uh, that are accessible from these ports. Now, so and then back to, so we've added, let's see if I can, I'll show you guys after, I want to run this and then we'll reposition and I'll show you how we've added air to the special chambers and uh, that way we can, as we're going in you guys, we're going to be blowing air out and we'll, we'll take this out and we'll show you what uh, other measures we've taken to make sure chips aren't going through into the chambers. So, if, uh, if yeah, we're ready. We'll do is I know we're going to be talking a little bit about the taps. For what it's worth. So, I got a question, Dylan. I know this is a specific application that requires different coatings on taps for copper. So, would you be able to give us a little bit more insight on what we're looking at and what we should expect from those taps in this material? So, Eddie, for this application, we're going to be using bright finished taps. Um, there is no coating or surface treatment on these specific taps. These are just highly polished and with creates a, a very sharp cutting edge. When threading materials like aluminum and copper, we want a sharp cutting edge that's a smooth, that's like a smooth surface finish. The material doesn't stick and it cuts smoothly and creates a good thread. So that's pretty much what we're doing here. There we go. So we, we got the unit hooked up and, and actually it's, uh, so the, the process, I'm gonna go through the process with you guys and it, it's gonna be a pretty time consuming process because similar to what Dylan had mentioned, the what, we're, what we discovered during some of the testing, especially in this material, is it, it's super gummy. So we, we have to, we're gonna drive it in, peck tap it out, and, and just a, a constant process in order to get it to that depth. Um, it's, it's kind of a necessary evil since we had to, since they had to hand tap it initially just to get the, the hole started. So we're picking up on those threads and then we're just gonna slowly drive it to that depth. And uh, I'm gonna, I'll get down here, we'll get started. Um, Kurt back there is going to add air when I ask him to. I'm going to engage. We're at uh, 15 RPM, and this is our inch and a quarter MPT. Air. So there's air coming out of the chamber now. I'm going to reverse here. We're going to take a look. Let's grab, uh, or you know, let me grab, I'm gonna, I'll get it close up for you guys. I think it's also important to mention, Nick, that we, uh, we install a sponge right inside of the hole so the chips wouldn't go in, but it also allows the air to come out. Yeah, and actually, now while I got this, I'll show you guys what, what Kurt was hooking up to one of the ports. 
which is on this on this stage of the chamber he's adding air here and then it, it's what it, where's that where's that high speed sponge and <laughs> i like we can show this so this is uh just the sponge that we use just to make sure while we added pressure just to guarantee that no chips were going to fall through while we were tapping so that's uh there's that and then here's a, a better close-up of the of the whole system and Max, I actually have a question that maybe some of the other viewers may have, and it may not be as straightforward as what we think. So obviously you don't want a ton of extra material in that. So why is it so important to keep chips out of that specific component? Um, if you actually look closely, we have uh, here about 240 cooling channels. Each of these dots actually right there represent a cooling channel. And we already went through great effort to, to take out all the powder from the 3D printer. Actually, when you 3D print, because you have, you have powder as the laser goes and sinters all the wall, the powder that was there where the channel is gets trapped in the part. And so before we did heat treatment and HIP and all of these other processes, that's why we did the initial tap. We blew high pressure air, we blew uh, liquid nitrogen, we also blew some water to measure the pressure drop uh, and make sure that it's all completely clean. We'll do more cleaning. We, we have to do chemical etching, LOX cleaning to, to make sure it's compatible with liquid oxygen later. But the more we can avoid the risk of having a chip going inside one of these channels and getting stuck, uh, the better. So this is why we have positive pressure and, uh, and kind of the sponge uh, solution there. Good, very good, man. And then uh, Dylan got another MPT tapping question for you, man. So I know that we work with a handful of them. Hey everyone, sorry about those technical difficulties. Let's jump right back in. So Dylan, as we were asking, when it comes to MPT taps working in copper, are there any other general recommendations that you might have for our viewers today? So Eddie, so basically when we, there's different type of pipe pipes out there and different applications we use them in. So in the US, we mainly run in two different types, MPT and MPTF. So national pipe tap taper is MPT, and then for MPTF, national pipe tap taper for fuel. So the difference lies really in the root and the crest of the threads. So MPTF is designed to interfere with the mating threads to create a mechanical seal. So it's really ideal for high heat or pressure applications. So MPT is designed not to interfere with the mating thread, but it'll require a seal to leak proof. So when you you have to like wrap some type of like a uh, thread tape around it to seal it off. So she also offers British standard pipe threads as well on our catalog. But very nice, very nice. So with this one here, and this is the one we just pulled out yeah, of the, yeah, you know, correct? Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about what is special with this specific tap here, my man? So this is just a regular MPT tap. It's a list 308 in our catalog. It's a bright coated tap. It's a regular MPT tap, actually. Very good. There we go. Very, very good. Very good. Yeah, just another great tool by our friends over there at OSG. So, Nick, what's next on the agenda, man? I think I, I, oh, there we go. What do we have? Oh, we got a question here from my man, Brian. So, why are they using NPT tape to bring propellant into the cooling jacket manifold instead of an ORB to AN slash JSE? All right, I'm having a hard time reading this, man. I'm hoping that somebody understands what he's trying to say. So conventionally, on a part like this, you would see a, a custom design flange instead of, a, a, for example, an NPT tap. Uh, or you might see an a, a welded on AN fitting or something like that. Now, we're not dealing with tradition, we're dealing with a single piece 3D printed combustion chamber. And we had to make a choice when designing uh, the port. We wanted to avoid welding or brazing, given it's a new material, copper, chromium, zirconium. It's pretty soft and we didn't have yet all the material properties. Uh, so we wanted something we could we could tap or uh, and avoid basically uh, 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 brazing. Uh, we also, because of the material, didn't want to go straight to a custom flange. It could be an option in the future, but again, too early in our development process. And then we had great experience with the smaller diameter, but uh, uh, NPT fittings on the E1 chamber. Now, if we did a, an AN fitting on this, one of the issues is because of the flat fitting standoff, the volume of each of these uh, ports would actually be greater. So while NPT is a bit unconventional and a bit more challenging to make sure it's leak proof at the pressure we have, uh, we felt we had enough experience that it was a good choice so that we could optimize for the volume and not end up having a, an even bigger port than this. 
apologize for absolutely butchering it. Isaac, do we have any other questions to pull up for the time being? Sounds like we got a handful of them. We'll wait and filter through and pull one of these bad boys up here. So, all right, not even gonna try to pronounce your name, but I like your little icon. Not sure what it is, but it looks cool. So, is the exhaust comb blue because of the copper ablating or the combustion chamber? So, great question. So, so the copper, copper burns are uh, green. So, if you see green with a copper liner engine, that's not a good thing. So, uh, hopefully we won't see that on this test. Uh, traditionally, basically, uh, kerosene burns yellow. And if you basically have the, uh, the combustion efficiency going towards 100%, it means all of the kerosene is combusting inside the cylinder and before the throat. And what you see coming out are the combustion product, which is mainly CO, CO2, and water, which uh, is more blue than, than when kerosene uh, reacts, basically. So it can be a demonstration of efficiency. If you look at a methane engine, you can see some of them on YouTube. Uh, they will have more of a blue, uh, a blue tint. But if you look at many kerosene engines from a Falcon 9 rocket to an Atlas V, uh, you will not see blue. That's the first time we've seen it and many people in the industry have seen it. And typically, even though some larger engine are high performance, they will use film cooling, so a thin layer of uh, more kerosene uh, towards the wall of the engine, which means that even though maybe it has a blue plume inside, you don't see it because they have a lower efficiency uh, kerosene on the wall of the, of the flame and the, and the combustion chamber wall. So it's, we believe, unprecedented, and we've proven it as per the video at the subscale. Um, when we start this engine uh, in our test at NASA's tennis in September, at first we will have lower efficiency, lower mix ratio, and as we dial it in, uh, we hope to get uh, the same result that we had subscale with our signature blue, uh, blue uh, exhaust. But obviously this is development. Uh, this is the first one full scale, 22,000 pound of thrust, and uh, we'll see what happens in September. What we know is we have the team and the partners that can uh, iterate the design, gather the data and improve. And uh, if we are uh, very skilled or lucky, whichever way you want to see, we'll, we'll reach that result on the first try. I'm very thankful that you're here with us today because Lord knows if I tried to answer these questions, I would absolutely just demolish them. So that's fantastic. Isaac, any other good questions that we have? Okay, we'll, we'll pull up one more before we get moving. Okay, we got someone double dipping today. Let's look at it. How much specific impulse is Launcher expecting from these 3D printed engines, both at sea level and with vacuum cone? Well, uh, we've, we've issued a launcher calculator, a rocket calculator, where you can compare our rockets and other rockets uh, engine. It's available at launchercalculator.com, one word. Um, in terms of our engine, you basically have three, three uh, important numbers. First, this is the sea level uh, version of the combustion chamber. So to fly, we obviously need a turbo pump, many other things, but we don't need an extension. We don't need anything else. This is for the first stage engine, the completed combustion chamber. At sea level, the specific impulse we expect or we target is 290. And for this nozzle, when we are in the vacuum of space, it's 327, I believe. Now for the second stage, we have the same combustion chamber, but from this point on, we have a different uh, nozzle extension. It gets bigger, wider diameter, and some of it is even uh, not manufactured using 3D printing. We showed that picture at the beginning, that was the engine on the right. Um, and with that optimized nozzle in the vacuum of space, I believe we are targeting around 365. Uh, I could be wrong, so check launchercalculator.com, but I think it's the right number. So. No, very good, very good. Obviously some solid questions. We're gonna hold off on some questions for the time being so we can kind of get things rolling. Nick, what are we looking at next? The, the last piece something I want to show you guys is just we're, we're gonna give a little bit better tour of the, of the whole rocket here, and I'm gonna show you how we're repositioning this to approach it from different angles. So let's see, so down here we obviously, this is our lock pen. And now we, we can simply just, we're gonna rotate it carefully, prepare it for our, our next hole. So now back to that, that alignment we were discussing earlier. So we've got the pin set then, and now we're able to, if we can get a close up of, uh, we'll show the, the big hole on the other end, where now we're gonna be able to, we're gonna adjust the angle of the arm and we're going to approach the, uh, the the chamber from this side, and then and then finish the the rest of the holes. So 
again, just to show the full spectrum of everything we're doing there, here you a better shot too of, uh, of the air nozzle on the, just on, on some of the manufacturing processes that we've had to go through to get everything set correctly. And, but no, uh, other than that, Eddie, that's, that's all I had. I mean, uh, it's been uh, one heck of a project. We've been super grateful to be involved. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Launcher's company here, I mean, there's, there's no doubt it's, uh, it's not gonna be rocket skill. These guys are super talented and, and they've got a, a great product here. So it's, it's been fun to be a part of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been a great demo. Now, I know um, we have a handful of questions. So, Isaac, if you could pick up, let's get another, another uh, lucky viewer or two. Let's get some questions. So see what else Max can knock out of the park today. There we go. We'll put you to the test. So A-Bomb 79, my man, joining us. I love it. Will you have to use some type of sealant for the MPT threads? This piece of the combustion chamber is actually cryogenic. It's using liquid, uh, liquid oxygen, which enter through this two port and then exit from this two port. Uh, the plan right now is to use a LOX compatible sealant, which it's a commercial brand called LOX 8. Um, and then uh, I don't know what the team has exactly in mind for the kerosene. It's obviously less sensitive. We could use some traditional uh, PTFE tape, uh, but they have a plan. But for sure, for this piece, we need uh, LOX compatible sealant for the track. All right, we have time for one more question. Isaac, who is our lucky viewer? Well, no we worries. Work. Yeah, it's all right. No, a lot of great questions, a lot of good content digested nonetheless. But, uh, but with that being said, I have a question for Dylan. I know we uh, feature a little bit of the MPT taps. So before we get wrapping, what are some of the largest and smallest MPT taps that OSG offers? So we offer five different series of pipe taps for all different types of applications. So we start at 1 16th of an inch and we go all the way up to two inches, Eddie. Very nice, very we're nice, we're man. We're testing the limits today. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what we do, there. that's what we do. So, and then um, I got a question, Max, for your perspective, man. So given a lot of the work and the back and forth you've done with Flexarm, how has your general experience been? We'd love to hear your feedback. I mean, it's amazing. We, we realized that we couldn't tap them by hand, which was the original plan. And uh, Lewis, one of our team members, found the flex arm from your YouTube video. We got in touch with the team through LinkedIn, and you know, amazingly, our partnership started. We got on a call. This was less than two months ago. In this time, not only you know, flex arm agreed to engage and has been interested for a long-term relationship to to help us. Secondly, they've built uh, this whole fixture with their partners, as you heard today. Obviously, put to, put to great use the existing technology of the of the flex arm. So uh, it's a, uh, you know, that's the kind of partnership we look for. They don't always exist. And uh, we, we're blown away by what you've done and, and extremely thankful. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to do more together. So uh, thank Likewise, you. Likewise, man, we're to see this stuff in orbit. No, it's, it's really been a good demo. And really thanks to all of your team as well as the flex arm team to help make this happen. We appreciate everybody joining on the live stream. Big, big, big shout outs to my man, A-Bomb79 for those MPT holders. Team Ins for helping us with this amazing frame. We got my man, Dylan from OSG. Thank you so much for these MPT taps we were able to feature today. And last, but certainly not least, our guy, Max and his team over at Launcher. Make sure you check them out because they're doing some amazing things that you won't want to miss. So before we get things wrapped up, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that bell to turn on the notifications so we can keep all of you in the loop with the amazing content that we have coming down the pipe and give us a huge thumbs up. I'm Eddie, you stay awesome, stay flexing, we're blasting off and we'll see you next time guys.